What is finance? Finance is the study or science of managing large sums of money. It is a huge umbrella used to reference any activities that have to do with investing, leveraging, capital, credit, markets, banking, and credit. Finance is also used to describe and direct the process of acquiring the funds. This is where the phrase finance a business, car, house, etc. comes from. Most basic financial concepts, where we will be discussing in more depth throughout this chapter, are derived from macroeconomic and microeconomic theories. The value of money is one of the most remarkable theories. This one suggests that the value of the dollar today is higher than it will be in the future. The study of finance can be divided into three categories, personal, corporate, and government, or public finance. The financial services sector drives a country's economy. This is the sector where businesses and customers interact to acquire financial goods. It acts as an intermediate where savers, consumers, offer funds to financial services, banks, stock brokerages, insurance companies, and other institutions and instruments, so they can lend them to borrowers, businesses, households, or the government. Subcategories of Finance Households, individuals and families, businesses, and governments can't operate if they don't have enough funding. Corporate Finance Corporate finance accounts for the financial activities that any business, corporation, or private institute conducts. These financial activities are associated with the operation and running of a business. The company typically has a team or an entire department responsible for overseeing and managing those financial activities. For instance, a situation relating to corporate finance would be a business determining if it should raise the needed bonds by offering stocks to the public or issuing bonds. Corporations may seek out the guidance of investment banks to help them make these financial decisions and aid them in the marketing activities related to the securities. Another example would be the capital that the startups need to operate their business. In that case, they can get the needed capital via venture capitalists or angel investors. In exchange, startups offer them a decided percentage of ownership. If this business wishes to grow and become a public corporation, it will issue shares on the stock exchange market. This can be done through an IPO, or initial public offering, allowing them to raise capital. While it can be very challenging, especially if the cost of running the startup is high, it may try to budget and save its capital. It will identify areas of the business that need financing, prioritize them, and decide which ones can be put off for later. This will allow those in charge to work towards priorities for the company's growth first, then tackle the next steps. Public Finance Public or government finance refers to a government's budgeting, spending, debt insurance, and tax policies. These policies influence the government's ability and the methods they use so it can pay for all the public services provided for its citizens. Public finance falls under the macroeconomic concept of fiscal policy, which refers to the impact tax policies and government spending have on economic activities like employment, the aggregate or overall demand for goods and services, inflation, economic growth, and inflation. A government's financial decisions and activities help it prevent a market failure. The state does so by managing the allocation of resources, overseeing the distribution of income, and maintaining general economic stability. Most of a government's funding comes from its tax policies. The state may often resort to borrowing from the public via banks or insurance companies. Governments can also seek funding from other countries. Besides managing the flow of money in regular daily operations, the state also oversees other fiscal and social activities and services. Since citizens, particularly those who are obliged to pay taxes, participate in fulfilling a government's funding needs, the state is expected to offer adequate social programs in return. It is also expected to maintain economic stability to reinforce trust and eliminate uncertainty among its people. Taxpayers need a guarantee that their money is safe and that they can save for the future. Personal Finance You're probably most concerned with personal finance if you're reading this book. 
When households participate in financial planning activities, they consider their current financial standing. This allows them to develop strategies that help them meet their future needs within their financial limitations. Personal finance refers to an individual's or a household's current financial activities and standing. These plans are highly dependent on a person's income, the standard of living, wants, needs, and goals. For instance, people need to take into account their retirement plans. To properly prepare for retirement, they need to make sure that they're saving up and investing enough money during their working years to finance their long-term plans. Personal finance comprises a wide array of activities, including investing in financial goods, such as insurance, credit cards, and mortgages. Banking also falls under the category of personal finance because households use Venmo, PayPal, and other mobile or e-payment services, savings accounts, and checking accounts. What are financial services? As mentioned above, financial services are the processes or intermediaries via which households and companies obtain financial goods. To simplify things, let's take a look at the financial service that a payment system provides. This service facilitates transactions between the person who pays and the entity that receives the funds. The function of this service is to accept and receive transfers between those parties and comprises accounts settled through debit cards, checks, credit cards, and electronic funds transfers. The financial services industry makes up one of the vital aspects of the economy. Without financial services, the economy wouldn't be able to operate. This sector drives liquidity and the free flow of capital in a nation's market. Finance companies, lenders, Insurance companies, real estate brokers, investment houses, accounting services, and banks are just a few financial institutions that make up this sector. This is an essential sector because it aids in the maintenance of a nation's economy. When both the economy and this sector are strong, the trust, assurance, and certainty of consumers or households rise and their purchasing power. Similarly, when this industry declines, the economy declines dragging the nation into a state of economic recession. It must be noted that financial goods and financial services are not the same. Financial services are not owned and can't be separated from their provider. For instance, receiving advice on your investments from a professional, having someone manage your investments, or receiving any other services provided by a financial advisor are all examples of financial services. On the other hand, Financial products are things that you can own, such as insurance policies, stocks and bonds, and mortgages. What are financial activities? Financial activities are any process, transactions, and strategies that companies, households, and governments take so they can take steps towards achieving their economic goals. These activities typically revolve around the flow of money, whether they are inflow transactions, receiving money, or outflows. Spending. Purchasing and selling assets or products, offering and receiving loans, keeping accounts, and issuing stocks are all examples of financial activities. Examples of a company's financial activities include repaying debts and offering shares. Households and governments participate in financial transactions, activities, when taxes are levied or loans are taken out. Economic concepts you need to know. The study of finance is driven by and derived from economics. While finance assess several components of the financial system, such as credit, investment, cash, and banking, economics is the study of the consumption, distribution, and production of goods and services in a market. Its main concern is the behavior and the financial interaction between the players in any economy, households, governments, and businesses. There are two subcategories of economics, macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomics focuses on the performance of an economy as a whole, while microeconomics is concerned with single factors of the economy and the impact of their individual decisions. Financial economics refers to analyzing markets and assessing how their resources are used and distributions. Economic theories evaluate how risks, opportunity costs, time, and certain information can affect an entity's financial decision. We know what you're probably thinking. I am here to learn how to budget for my household's needs 
save for my retirement plan, or make better investment decisions? How will understanding economic theories help me? Well, as dramatic as this may sound, the essence of economics influences every aspect of our lives. The proof here is that fundamentally, economics aims to explain the reasons behind our financial choices. Understanding the reasons behind your financial decisions is the key to making better spending choices. The following concepts can help you understand why you make the financial choices you do. Scarcity Scarcity is a concept that everyone understands because we've all experienced its impact in one way or another. As you can guess from the term, scarcity references one of the most common and basic economic problems to exist, that is, having fewer or limited resources in comparison to the world's unlimited wants. No matter how many resources there are, there will never be enough to meet the world's infinite desires. This is why we are obliged to allocate our resources as efficiently as possible. Making smart financial and budgeting decisions would allow us to ensure that our highest priorities are always met. For instance, let's say there is only so much land that we can plant every year. While some people want apples, others want cucumbers. Only a limited amount of either good can be produced because of the scarcity of agricultural land. So, how do those in charge determine how much land to allocate to plant apples and cucumbers? The only way to decide is by examining the concept of supply and demand, the drivers of a market system. Supply and demand Supply and demand are what drive a market system. Let's take the example above. When many people are willing to buy apples at a given price, the demand for apples is relatively high. This is why apple sellers are prompted to charge more for them. Charging a higher price allows them to make more profit and meet the rising demand. Farmers who plant the apples will also charge the sellers more for the fruit and will be compelled to allocate more land to planting apples than cucumbers. In most cases, other people will want to start selling apples too, or the goods in the high demand, so they can also profit. As a result, there will be plenty of apples in the market after a couple of production cycles. People then will expect to pay a lower price for the apples because they're so abundant now. Additionally, supply is a lot higher than demand at that point, production surplus, so fewer apples will be produced. The supply of apples decreases, and so does the price. Even though the concept of supply and demand is very simplified in this example, you can still understand how supply and demand work together to determine the price of goods. You can also see why many popular products are almost half the price after a year or so. Costs and Benefits Economics is based on a very important theory, the concept of rational choice and expectations. This theory plays a huge role in how we make our financial decisions, as it's related to how we measure a product or service's cost against its benefits. In economics, rational behavior refers to an individual's effort to maximize the ratio of costs to benefits when they make any financial decision. For example, landowners will hire more workers to plant or harvest apples if there's high demand. However, this would work only in the case if the selling price of apples, along with the number of apples being sold, were worth the additional costs incurred by the landowner. Higher wages, more advanced agricultural technology, and perhaps land expansions are examples of these costs. Similarly, customers will search for the highest quality of apples they can afford to buy. Fresh, pesticide-free, firm, lack discolorations, etc. But not necessarily pay for organic apples sold at specialty grocers. This concept is not limited to financial decisions, which shows how far the study of economics is involved in our lives. For instance, you perform a cost-benefit analysis whenever you prioritize a certain task over another. Because it's important that we act rationally and maximize the ratio of costs to benefits, it's important to realize whenever we aren't ratios. Daily advertisements and marketing tactics can trick us into overestimating the benefits of purchasing a certain good or service. Incentives As humans, we are all inclined to perform better when offered a reward or an incentive. On an economic level, the interaction of supply and demand in the market can act as an incentive for producers to offer the goods that households want and for households to preserve scarce resources. 
As you know by now, prices rise when demand increases, so suppliers have the incentive to supply more of that commodity because they can now make more profits. However, this increase in supply and demand prompts scarcity of raw material, and so the cost to produce that good rises, causing suppliers to supply less. The price of the goods rises even more, and so consumers will now have an incentive to cut back on their consumption. Consumers will never pay more for a product than its esteemed value of it. In the example of an apple seller, the landowner wants to increase the production of apples. One way to do that would be offering an incentive, or a raise in wages, to the farmers who harvest the most apples in a given time frame. In a couple of weeks, the number of apples produced rises. The problem here is that the landowner offered the incentive for the number of apples produced rather than their quality. The store owner that the landowner supplies called to complain about the quality of the apples he received. Because the higher wages were offered for the number of apples harvested, farmers found it more efficient to pick the apples slightly earlier than they were supposed to. This is why people should be careful and precise when offering incentives. They should align with the individual's or business's goals. What is financial literacy and why is it important? Financial literacy refers to an individual's knowledge regarding managing their credit, finances, and debt. All responsible and rational decisions are based on your level of financial literacy. These decisions include but aren't limited to setting up a budget, knowing how to use different financial tools, and when to refer to financial institutions and professionals, and paying off debt. In short, Financial literacy has a huge influence on an individual's ability to make ends meet, cover their priorities and basic needs, finance their kids' education, purchase a home, and plan out their retirement. Many people, even those who live in advanced economies, struggle with financial illiteracy. There are people across the world who don't grasp basic financial concepts, which is why they have trouble maintaining a certain standard of living. Generally speaking, the higher the lack of financial literacy in an economy, the poorer the overall nation is. However, it's still worth noting that even though income levels and the quality of education influence a person's level of financial literacy, it was found that many high-income and educated households maintain the same level of financial ignorance as the less fortunate. Thinking about financial issues and matters can be incredibly stress-inducing and anxiety-triggering which can be very troublesome for many people. As you can probably already tell, financial literacy is vital because it allows people to make informed decisions when it comes to handling their finances. Additionally, the number of financial burdens and responsibilities that fall on an individual increases over time. At the most basic level, past employers managed their employees' retirement accounts. Nowadays, however, Self-directed retirement accounts shift this responsibility over to employees. The number of financial options and products available has also increased greatly. Credit can also be accessed more easily. This means that the number of choices that an individual has to make is greater. In this chapter, we covered what finance as a study is and the main economic factors that influence our financial decisions. You better understand how the interplay of supply and demand impact price levels, a producer's willingness to supply, and a consumer's willingness to produce. You also understand the importance of financial literacy, which is something that this book is guaranteed to help you grow. Your Financial Mindset Your financial health is just as relevant as your physical, mental, and emotional health. This is because your financial situation can greatly impact your overall well-being. Checking up on your finances every now and then can help you determine the areas in your life you need to adjust, budget for, or manage more efficiently. In this chapter, we will help you assess where you stand financially. Knowing where you stand in terms of your finances will give you a starting point from which you can grow to achieve your financial goals. Here, you will understand whether your relationship with money is holding you back and how you can improve how you view and use money. Finally, you'll learn how to set monetary goals and track your spending in this chapter. Where do you stand financially? When was the last time you took a step back and evaluated your financial situation? Well, if you're reading this book, the chances are that you aren't happy with your financial position in life. However, 
Did you actually take the time to identify which habits you need to get rid of or what smart financial behaviors you need to start adopting? Financial issues can wreak havoc on mental, emotional, and physical health. This is why we always need to be aware of our financial standing. Checking up on your financial activities, from income to spending and everything in between, can help you make the necessary changes. This is why we are here to tell you the five most important steps you need to take when evaluating your financial well-being. Consider your net worth. When evaluating your financial health, you need to determine your net worth. This is a quick and easy way to evaluate your current financial position. All you need to do is to find the sum of the value of all of your assets and then subtract your liabilities. Grab a piece of paper and think about everything you own, whether your home, car, cash, or investments. Then, subtract all you consider a liability debts you need to pay. This can be your credit card debt, pending mortgage payments, student loans, etc. It's important to note that your income shouldn't be included when you're calculating your net worth. This exercise is no more than a mere indicator of what you own and what you owe. The best thing about calculating your net worth is that it allows you to compare yourself, not to others, but to yourself. This way, you can easily determine if your financial situation is improving or deteriorating. Let's say that your home is your only asset, to make things simple. Assume your home is worth $250,000 and you have $200,000 worth of liabilities. In that case, your net worth would be $50,000. Your net worth grows as you cover more and more of your mortgage. This is assuming that the value of your home doesn't decrease. Don't get discouraged if your net worth is currently a negative number. The only point behind calculating it is so you can keep track of it regularly. Think of it as a personal financial unit of measurement. It will help you understand how well you're using your money. Remember that everyone's opportunities and circumstances are unique, which is why you should never compare your net worth to that of others. As a good rule of thumb, set a goal to increase your net worth by 5 to 10% each year. Then, calculate how much of your debt you need to cover to reach that goal. Find out your debt to income ratio. Now that you've calculated your net worth, you can actually account for your income. To calculate your debt to income ratio, you need to divide your monthly gross income by the amount of money you pay in debt repayments. For instance, if your monthly gross income pre-tax deductions and other possible deductions is $8,000 and you have a monthly $2,000 mortgage payment, $200 to pay for your car, another $200 for your student loans, and a $100 in credit card payments. In that case, your total debt payments would be $2,500 and your debt-to-ratio income would be 31.25%. Maintaining a ratio of 30% is highly recommended by lenders and people in general. However, to stay on the safe side, aim for 20% or lower. Calculating this ratio allows you to work out if you are managing your debt properly. You should start worrying if your debt ratio is at 40 to 50%. The ratio is a key factor in terms of your credit score. The higher the ratio, the fewer the mortgage lenders will be who will agree to work with you. Can you afford your home? 40% of the average American's budget is spent on housing alone, as per 2017 data. For instance, if someone earns an annual salary of $70,000, they end up paying $28,000 on housing. Alarming, right? Remember the housing crisis that happened in 2008? To avoid another crisis, the only solution is for people to start living in houses they can afford. When determining how much you pay for housing, you need to remember there is more to account for than just your mortgage payment. For instance, you will have to pay for transportation to and from work, despite the cheaper rent payment, if you live somewhere outside the city. If you live in the heart of the city, you may not have to pay as much for commuting, but you'll probably pay a premium rental. If your calculations reveal that you're paying too much for housing, consider moving to a more affordable place or finding a roommate to share your costs with. Track your spending. Many people overlook the importance of budgeting their money. 
At most, they ensure they don't draw more money than they can afford to and save as much money as they can each month. However, if you want to reach your financial goals, you need to know where each penny is coming from and where you will be spending it. Even though this may sound unreasonable and time-consuming, it's the only way you'll ever move forward. You can do that by setting up a budget and making sure that you stick to it. Know what you want to spend on each category, food, clothes, rent, etc., to come up with a budget that suits your income. You can be flexible in the sense that you can move your money around from one category to the other. The ultimate goal is not to spend more than the amount of money you've budgeted for the month while managing to cover your needs. After determining where your money is going, you can set up a suitable budget. You need to ensure that you allocate an amount toward your savings. Set goals. You need to set financial goals for yourself, which we will discuss in more depth throughout the chapter. This is the most critical thing you can do when checking up on your financial wellness. Your goals will serve as a mark that you can measure your performance against. Improving your relationship with money. Money is not something that people normally talk about. We are never taught the basics of money management and financial literacy in school. Unless people decide to learn about money themselves, just like you're doing now, experience and observations are your only sources for learning. Our understanding of money is shaped by our friends, family, and community from a very young age. Overhearing a conversation about someone's finances or receiving information via sources of information can also influence the way we view money. All of these external sources combine in our subconscious to form what is known as our money identity. People who often hear their parents say that they can't afford certain stuff grow up believing that money is a scarce resource. This is why they often feel guilty when they spend money and don't like spending it. Those who grow up in communities where having money was deemed as unimportant or owning a vehicle was indicative of greed or laziness tend to disregard the financial side of life altogether. These are all examples of limiting beliefs. Once you grow up and get away from these influential factors, one would think that you can develop your own money identity. However, unfortunately, the opposite usually happens, and these beliefs grow more and more powerful. Having a bad relationship with money can impact plenty of areas of your life. Depending on where the issues lie, you may struggle with saving money, paying off debts, overspending, or even underspending. Limiting money beliefs can trick you into believing that you will never be able to handle your money rationally. So, if no one ever speaks about money, how do you fix your relationship with it? Understand that money is a tool. The key to building a good relationship with money is to view it as no more than a tool. Tools like hammers can be helpful or destructive, depending on how you use them. If you don't know how to use a hammer, you'll probably break everything you landed on. If you know how to use it, you can build amazing things. Knowing how to use money can help you build the life you desire. Money mismanagement, on the other hand, can be detrimental. Don't complicate it. Money is not hard to understand. Understanding how it works and how you can use it for your greater good is not beyond you. Any steps toward improving your financial literacy will help you move toward your goals. Challenge your money identity. It's easy to let our upbringing and previous experiences shape our perception of money. Instead of letting your parents' beliefs about money influence yours, take the time to observe and learn from how they managed their money. Why was money scarce in your household? Were they having trouble saving their money? Did they have clear financial goals? Did they believe that financial wellness only came with certain types of jobs? Did they not budget their income efficiently? Use positive money affirmations. Our subconscious leads us to believe the phrases that we repeat over and over again. For instance, the more you talk negatively about your finances and your lack of ability to manage them, the more you'll believe that you can never change your financial situation. Therefore, you will probably never consider taking steps to improve your finances. Similarly, when you use positive statements such as, I can achieve my money goals, or I am capable of overcoming financial challenges. Your relationship with money will improve significantly. 
believe that you can change your financial situation. Your financial situation may not be ideal at the moment. This can be discouraging. However, it helps to remember that this can change if you get a raise, find a better job, or start saving diligently. You will never feel good about your relationship with money if you don't start believing that all life situations are temporary. There will come periods in life when you are strapped for cash, and others when you don't have to worry about rewarding yourself with a trip or something expensive that you've been eyeing. The difference is that when you know how to use your money, you will learn how to deal with financial pitfalls or even avoid them altogether. Stop comparing. Nothing ruins our relationship with ourselves and other things in life like comparisons. Our sense of self-worth and accomplishment is hindered when we compare our progress to that of others. We struggle with self-love and confidence when we compare our appearance to that of others. We feel less financially secure when we compare our standard of living with that of others. That trip to Bali that your friend was posting about or the luxurious home that your neighbor lives in doesn't suggest that they're excelling in life and you're not. Everyone's journey and circumstances are different. Setting financial goals and achieving them. Many people try their best to improve their financial situation, but see no progress whatsoever. They slave away at work, but it never seems to pay off. This is because they don't know what they want to achieve. You already know that you need to have financial goals if you want to improve your money situation. Financial goals are any plans that you have regarding your money. You can set goals for a year, five, or ten years from now, as long as your plan is rational and feasible. Here's how you can set financial goals and stick to them. Write down your goals. Did you know that you are more likely to achieve your goals when you write them down? Many people feel committed when they write things down because they're no longer random thoughts or floating commitments. You can hold yourself accountable by writing down your goals and putting them somewhere visible. Be specific. Whenever you set a goal for yourself, you need to be specific. Don't just write down, I want to improve my financial situation. Instead, you need to narrow it down. Figure out which aspects of your financial situation you'd like to change and prioritize them. Let's say your goals are to buy a home and pay off your debts. It would make more sense to tackle the latter first. They have to be measurable and time-bound. If you have a large sum in outstanding debt, you'll need to break this amount into smaller numbers. Then, decide on the deadlines or time frames you need to have those debts paid off. For instance, you can write down, I will pay off $10,000 of debt by January 2023, instead of, I will pay off most of my debt soon. Setting a specific amount of money can help you measure whether you've achieved your goal. Your goals and deadlines should be challenging but not impossible to achieve. They should be your own goals. We all tend to get swayed by what everyone else is doing in life. It's easy to overhear your friends say that they're saving up to buy a car and you immediately think, oh, I should buy a car too. If you've never thought about purchasing one until that moment, then you probably don't need it now. Your goals should be about you and your needs. Setting financial goals for yourself can help improve your relationship with money. All the points we've discussed in this chapter are related to each other. Doing these things will prompt you to analyze all your financial decisions and realize how all your choices impact your financial well-being. The way you use and view your money impacts every aspect of your being. It affects your mental, physical, and emotional health. How secure we are with our finances also dictates our social relationships and interactions. This is why financial literacy is one of the most important skills anyone can obtain. Creating a Financial Plan A financial plan will help secure your future. The days of guaranteeing the future could be long gone and the uncertain times we live in could be the new normal. However, we need to be prepared as best we can. We all have financial goals and objectives, and a successful financial plan can help us achieve these goals. When you have a strategy, you have a path to follow to manage your finances which will, in turn, help you secure your future. 
It doesn't matter how old you are or what stage of life you are at. We all need to create a financial plan right now. The sooner the better. What is a financial plan? A financial plan is a documented analysis that gives you a clear picture of your current finances, assets, investments, and liabilities. It also allows you to prioritize your objectives and provide you with strategies to achieve your financial goals. The plan should include all the details related to your finances, like your cash flow, debts, savings, insurance, and so on. It is impossible to meet someone nowadays who isn't stressed about money unless they are a Hollywood star or a football player. We are all struggling to figure out what we should do to be financially secure and save for the future. A clear financial plan will put you on the right track by allowing you to take advantage of your assets and adjust your expenses to meet your objectives. You won't be able to meet your financial goals if you don't have an insight into your finances that can inform you whether or not you are on the right track with your savings or if you need to change your spending habits. A financial plan can be long-term, especially if you plan for your retirement, or short-term, for a few months if your goal is in the near future. Financial plans aren't fixed. You can always make any changes to them if you encounter any unexpected expenses, like a hospital stay or having a child. Some people think that creating a financial plan isn't for them because of the misconception that you have to be wealthy to plan your finances. However, everyone can benefit from a financial plan, no matter their financial situation. In fact, it can help you grow your income and increase your wealth in the long run. Why you need a financial plan Security One of the main reasons people create financial plans is to secure their future especially if they have a family. Planning your finances allows you to manage your money better, thus increasing your savings. You will be able to financially cover any unexpected expenses that life throws at you, like losing your job or unplanned pregnancy. Having money set aside for emergencies will help provide you and your family with financial security. Growing your income a financial plan will help you keep track of your income and expenses to grow your money and achieve your financial goals. As your income grows, so will your cash flow. Monitoring your daily spending habits will make you aware of your daily expenses to cut down any necessary expenses and focus on your priorities. You become more in control of your finances and thus develop better and smarter spending habits. Invest your money. Once you become aware of your income and expenses and start saving money, you can find the right investment that will help you to expand your wealth and achieve your financial goals. Preparing for inflation The world has become uncertain, and many current events have led to rampant inflation. It has become the fact that we just can't escape. The value of money has been declining and will continue to do so. A financial plan will help you deal with inflation as you prepare for your future and, hopefully, a retirement without any no financial worries. Achieving your goals We all have long-term goals, like buying a house or a car. Saving money to achieve these goals isn't easy, unless you have a clear plan and a time period that you set for yourself. Manage your debt Many of us get into debt as a result of taking loans from banks to buy a home or make any big purchases. And we also can't forget about credit card debt. Without a careful financial plan, debt can turn into a financial crisis. As mentioned, a financial plan will allow you to track your expenses and income, save money, and pay your debt. Retirement You will need to have a stable income next to your pension to afford to have a comfortable lifestyle after retirement. A financial plan will help you save enough money for your future life after you retire. Financial planning will provide you with a secure and brighter future. How to create a successful personal financial plan Young people can fall into the trap of thinking that it's too early to start planning for their future, and a lot of older people think it is too late, so there is no point. However, in all seriousness, it is never too late or too early to start planning your finances for a better tomorrow. So now that you know what a financial plan is and why it is necessary to have one, we will discuss how to create a successful personal financial plan. Assess your current situation. 
you shouldn't start planning without first assessing your current financial situation. We pay our monthly requirements as if by habit, without paying attention to the amount of money we are spending. So, take a moment to check your bank statements to see how much you pay for rent, gas, electricity, bank charges, Netflix, etc. for the last year. Naturally, you will notice some irregular spending. This will point out the unnecessary expenses you will need to cut down. You should also determine your net worth by subtracting your liabilities, mortgage, loans, or debts, from your assets, car, home, and the money in your bank account. Your net worth will normally change, for instance, when you pay off your debt or buy a new home, so you should keep track of it. If your assets are larger than your liabilities, then you have a good net worth. Set financial goals. Once you become aware of your net worth and unnecessary expenses, you can start with the first step of your financial planning, which is setting your financial goals. This is a vital step, as it will point you in the right direction. Setting smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-bound goals is best. Your purpose shouldn't simply be saving money. It has to be more specific and detailed than that. How much money do you want to save? Why do you need this money? When should this money be ready? Is your goal long-term or short-term? This is how you set SMART goals. You will also need to figure out your goals by treating yourself like you are in a job interview and asking yourself this tough question. Where do you see yourself in 5, 10, or 20 years? The answer to this question will help you put into perspective your priorities. For instance, do you see yourself as a homeowner, living abroad, starting a family? Once you decide where you want to be, you can start planning your finances accordingly. We all have different goals, and saving for all of them at once may not be realistic. So, consider the most important ones you will need at this stage of your life. For instance, if you are starting a family and need a bigger home, it makes sense to prioritize saving for a home over saving for retirement. If you can save for two goals at once, this will be ideal, like saving for your children's college and retirement plan. Simply put, set your priorities straight. Paying your debt takes precedence over saving for retirement, but saving for retirement is more important than saving for traveling. So, make a list of all the things you hope to achieve whether buying a new car or even buying an expensive sweater. Seeing your goals put down on paper will keep you motivated so that you can turn them into a reality. Consider your debt. How will you be able to save money if you are paying off your debt? For this reason, we recommend you pay off your debt first. Include your debt in your financial plan and figure out a way to get rid of this burden ASAP. Remember, Fees and interest rates with debt usually add to your expenses, so the sooner you pay them off, the better. When you are debt-free, you will have the financial freedom to save money to achieve your goals. Create a budget. Creating a budget is another vital step that will help you achieve your financial objectives. That said, you can't just create a budget. You must also stick to it. U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren has come up with a great way to set a budget by dividing your income, after taxes, into three categories. 20% for savings, 30% for your wants, and 50% for the essentials. We will discuss in detail how to create a budget in the next chapter. Creating an emergency fund. Having a financial plan means that you will always be prepared for emergencies that would require unexpected expenses which can impact your financial objectives. Many of us live paycheck to paycheck, so we aren't prepared in case of accidents or illness. Having a financial safety net will come in handy in the case of emergencies, like losing your job. The amount of money you should put aside for emergencies will depend on your expenses. So make sure to save an amount that will last you for six months. Establishing an emergency fund is necessary if your job or career isn't stable or you have a poor credit score. As we have mentioned, we live in uncertain times. Many people have lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19, and now we are suffering the impact of war, so we don't know what the future holds. This is why you should set money aside to provide you with peace of mind during these unpredictable times. 
so you must include an emergency fund in your financial plan. Consider investment. Many people consider saving their money, but only a few consider investing this money. The investment will help you increase your wealth and give you security for when you retire. We will discuss how to invest your money later on in this book. Estate planning. No one of us wants to think of death, but we need to make sure that our loved ones are taken care of when we aren't here. You don't have to be rich or an elderly citizen to start estate planning. Include it in your financial plan now to have a peace of mind and guarantee the protection of your loved ones. Your estate plan should include power of attorney, last will and testament, trust information, and health care directives. The first step in estate planning is to write down your will and assets and decide who will be trusted with this information. This is a big step with so much on the line, so we suggest you hire a lawyer to help you out. Insurance You may not see it now, but insurance is actually an investment. It will protect your health and assets and even ensure your family is provided for when you aren't around anymore. There are various types of insurance, but we suggest you focus on the essential ones. Health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, homeowner's insurance, and auto insurance. Insurance is just like an emergency fund that will prevent you from dipping into your savings in case of an emergency. Consider your taxes. No one enjoys doing their taxes, and they can be very confusing. Figuring out how taxes work will help you with achieving your long-term goals. There are two essential things that you should consider when you are planning your taxes. Itemizing your deductions and reducing your taxable income. Itemizing your deductions will allow you to reduce your taxable income as someone who is self-employed, working part-time, or full-time. You will be able to lower your taxable income by deducting incurred costs from doing business. Taking advantage of tax-saving investing options like 401k and 403b will also help you lower your taxable income to save money. Plan for your retirement. As we've said, it's never too early to start planning and preparing for your retirement. In fact, the earlier you start saving, the better your older self will be grateful that you have decided to take this crucial step now. The younger you start, the longer you will have to save money and thus secure your future. However, if you start at an older age, you should put more money in your retirement fund. We suggest you save about 10 to 15% of your income, after tax, every year for your retirement. Keep track of your plan. Financial plans aren't cast in stone, and your goals can change along the way. And so will your plan. For this reason, you should review your plan regularly and make the necessary adjustments. For instance, as you grow older and advance in your career, your income will increase. So you can increase the amount you set aside each month for your savings as well. Additionally, Keeping track of your financial plan will prevent you from skipping payments every once in a while to ensure you stick to your goals. You should also reevaluate your plan after big financial ventures, like having kids or buying a new car. Reviewing your plan will allow you to keep track of your progress, which will help you keep motivated. Additionally, you will be able to notice if there are any issues that you need to work on, like eating out less so that you can reduce your expenses. You should also seek the help of a financial advisor to help guide you through the process and provide advice when necessary. An example of a financial plan. Your personal financial plan must include this information. All your personal information. Age, children, tax filing status, income, etc. Your financial goals, which include your assets and debt as well. A plan for your debt elimination an investment plan to increase your wealth, insurance, an estate plan, income tax strategies. Creating a financial plan is a big step towards securing your future. There are many benefits to creating a financial plan to help you achieve your long-term and short-term goals. However, you should take your plan very seriously and stick to it. Make it a habit to always set a specific amount of money aside for the future. Set your priorities straight and focus on your main goals. Financial planning is all about having a secure future for you and your loved ones. 
you will be able to take care of any emergencies or unexpected expenses that come your way. Most of all, you should always review your plan. You won't be able to determine if your financial plan is working or not if you don't regularly check it. This will give you the chance to make the necessary adjustments in case you aren't making any progress. Your future starts now. Take the step today and start planning your finances for a better and brighter tomorrow. Remember, it is never too late or too early to start planning for your future. Budgeting and Saving We've gone over how budgeting is an essential part of your finances in the previous chapters. It is a map that helps you see where your money is going and if you are overspending and need to make better decisions with your money. When you make a budget, you are essentially making a plan for how you will spend your money. This will help you pay off your debt, put some money aside for emergencies, and cover your expenses. A budget allows you to prioritize and set a spending limit so you can protect your finances and save for your future. You may find sitting down and planning a budget tedious because you want to have fun and enjoy your hard-earned money like everyone else. However, this small inconvenience beats drowning in debt. And once done, you know where you are and how much you have to buy all the things you want and achieve your goals with the money you save. The Importance of Budgeting Controls Your Spending Thanks to credit cards, we all spend money we don't have and on things we don't need in many cases. We end up in debt and have to figure out ways to pay it off. How do we expect to save money when we are living beyond our means? Credit cards don't allow us to keep track of our spending, resulting in overspending and debt. In fact, one of the biggest problems we have is that we let our money control us instead of the other way around. Planning a budget and sticking to it will save you from this unnecessary pain. You will be able to control your spending and save money once you plan your monthly expenses in advance and don't go over your planned budget. Improves your spending habits. We don't usually pay attention to the amount of money we spend each month until we run out of it before the month ends or find ourselves in debt. Ask yourself, do you really need to eat out every day? Do you have to subscribe to every streaming service? If you take a look at your spending habits, you will realize there are many things that you are wasting your money on. A budget will show you the unnecessary expenses you make to improve your spending habits and develop real financial goals. Keeps you focused on financial goals. It isn't realistic to buy just anything you see and like at a store or eat at fancy restaurants every day. How will you be able to save to buy a house or to pay for college? Your goals are more important than satisfying your every whim, especially your long-term goals that will guarantee you live a comfortable and financially secure life. Planning a budget will help you stay motivated, disciplined, and focused on your long-term goals to create a secure future for yourself and your family. Provide you with security. As we have mentioned, life is filled with unexpected surprises and you may find yourself having to pay for expenses that you haven't planned for. If you aren't careful with your money, you may end up in a financial crisis as a result. A budget will help you build an emergency fund to provide you and your family with security in case of any unfortunate event and give you peace of mind knowing you can financially support your family in any given situation. How to organize and develop a written budget. You need to create a monthly budget to plan your expenses and savings for each month, track your progress, and more importantly, get into the habit of being aware of your spending patterns. We understand that many people don't like to create a budget because they feel it is limiting, especially if you are young and want to spend your money. You are probably thinking, leave budgeting for older people. However, a budget helps you plan a secure future and you are never too young to start planning for tomorrow. Before creating your budget, you should write down all the necessary information and be ruthlessly honest with yourself. We know it can be hard to face your spending habits. The truth may hurt, especially if you are an overspender and weren't aware of it. But this is the only way you can create an effective budget and fix these habits. Prepare the necessary paperwork. The first step is to prepare all the necessary paperwork to help you plan your budget. You will need bank statements, utility bills for the last couple of months, 
credit card bills, mortgage statements, 1099s, investment accounts, W-2s, and pay stubs, and recent receipts. Calculate your income. Calculating your income after tax is the most crucial step that you should take when preparing your budget. How much money do you make each month? This doesn't just include your salary, but other sources like social security, child support, government benefits, or investments. If you are a business owner, you should include the money that goes into your pocket, the salary you give yourself, not how much money the business makes. If you are a freelancer or your income varies each month, include an average of what you earn. Write down your fixed expenses. Write down all your mandatory expenses like rent, heat, electricity bill, internet, insurance, water, medication, child support, child care, alimony, car payment, student loan, and transportation. Many of these expenses are fixed, so you won't have to guess. Looking at your bank statement and receipts for the last couple of months will provide you with all the information you need. You should also include your debt if you have any. Write down variable expenses. Variable expenses are the expenses that change every month, like gas, groceries, and phone bills. Write down the average amount for each of these expenses, and check your bank or credit card statements for the last three to six months to make an estimate. You should also write down any unexpected expenses that you think might affect your budget. Non-essential expenses. After adding all your essential expenses, you should now add the non-essential ones. They are usually the ones that aren't as necessary, and you may be able to give up or spend less money on them. These expenses include unnecessary clothing, gifts, eating out, house cleaning, streaming services subscription, travel, cable TV, home decor, personal grooming, and gym membership. Your monthly expenses versus your monthly income. You will need to do some math to figure out which is higher your monthly income, or your monthly expenses. The ideal is if your income is higher, because this means that you have enough money to cover all your expenses and put some on the side or to pay off your debt. In this case, you can apply the 50-30-20 method discussed in the previous chapter. However, if you have discovered that you spend more money than you make, you know you should make some serious changes to your spending habits. Cut down unnecessary expenses. How can you reduce your expenses and save some money? Focus on unnecessary expenses like eating out, having your hair done every week, or shopping for expensive clothes. Give up these things or make smarter buying decisions. For instance, if you need clothes, wait for sales or offers so you can buy more for less. You must reach a point where your income covers all of your essential expenses with some despair. However, if you are in debt, you may need to make more drastic changes. In this case, you will have to cut down some of your fixed expenses that aren't essential, like canceling your cable TV or streaming service subscriptions. You should also find ways to increase your income by working extra hours or getting a freelance job. Use your budget. Now that you have created a budget, you should start using it. Like your financial plan, you should keep track of your budget and regularly review it. Focus on your expenses for every day of the month. You can write your budget on a spreadsheet or use an app to make it easy to track your expenses. In the next chapter, we will provide you with a list of various apps that can help you keep track of your finances. Writing down all your expenses will help you recognize if you have unhealthy spending habits or will give you an idea if you are wasting your money on unnecessary items or not. Set a reminder on your phone so you remember to include the day's expenses in your budget every day. Don't wait until the end of the month, because you will have forgotten what you spent your money on by then. You should also set a spending limit for each of your expenses. However, as you are still new to budgeting, you may reach the spending limit before the end of the month. You will then be left with two options. Accept that you have reached your limit, don't go over budget and make adjustments next month, or move money from another category, maybe from an unnecessary expense. For instance, if you eat out or order delivery food every day at work and run out of money, bring food from home instead, like sandwiches or a salad, instead of going over budget. 
or you can use your transportation money to buy food and walk to work instead. The bottom line is that your expenses should not exceed your income. How to save money Having a budget and sticking to it will help you save money. However, many people still struggle with saving. It's not easy, but it can get less complicated once you figure out how and can become a good habit to pick up. Save money from your salary increases and bonuses. Whenever we get a raise or a bonus at work, the first thing we do is spoil ourselves. You either buy something expensive you have always wanted, travel, or go on a shopping spree. However, if you want to save or invest your money, your salary raise or bonus provides you with the perfect opportunity. So when you get a raise, try not to change your spending habits. If you spend the same amount you did before your raise, the extra money can go to your savings account, retirement fund, or emergency fund. You need to set aside money for emergencies, about three to six months worth of expenses, as we have mentioned. We suggest that you keep this money in a savings account where you can get a decent interest rate. You can take a percentage from it and add it to your savings account if you get a bonus. This will help you reach your goal of saving for an emergency fund faster. We suggest that you opt for a high-yield savings account because it is safe, offers interest over 2%, and you can easily withdraw your money whenever you need it. How much money should you save each month? This mainly depends on your salary, financial situation, and expenses, but finance experts suggest that you start saving $500 each month and go up from there. The Importance of an Emergency Fund we have been stressing the importance of an emergency fund in the last chapter and this one. But what exactly is an emergency fund? Why is it so important? What is an emergency fund? An emergency fund is taking a percentage of your salary and bonuses and putting them in a savings account in a bank. You only use this money in case of emergencies, like losing your job, medical expenses, or major home or car repairs. Why is an emergency fund important? Losing your job. If you only depend on your salary for your income, then having an emergency fund is vital. It will serve as a safety net if you lose your job, especially if you have a family and are the sole breadwinner. Make sure to set a year's worth of expenses as your safety net to ensure you and your family are taken care of until you find a new job. Remember, you or a family member may suffer medical issues while you are out of work, so the larger your emergency fund, the better equipped you will be to handle these situations. Unsteady Jobs Whether your job or career is unsteady, like working as a freelancer or an artist, or self-employed with no unemployment benefits, you can benefit from an emergency fund. Self-employment isn't easy, and the market is unstable, some days up and others down. An emergency fund will keep you covered during the times when the market is down and your business is slow. Medical Emergencies Healthcare has become more expensive than ever. Many Americans suffer in silence because they can't afford to pay medical bills. A health issue can come out of nowhere, leaving you and your family struggling to make ends meet. You can't count on employer-sponsored insurance because you lose your insurance if you quit or were let go of your job. An emergency fund will help you give your family the best health care and provide you with peace of mind. Another point to bear in mind is that if you or any family member suffer from chronic diseases or any health issues, this could leave you in debt. An emergency fund will keep you covered to pay for medication, hospital stay, and routine tests and checkups. Car and House Repairs House and car repairs can be costly and are considered essential expenses if they are serious. For instance, if you use your car to drive to work every day, you will need to fix it right away rather than be late for work or have to pay for transportation. The same applies to your house. If your roof leaks or the water heater is broken, it will need to be fixed. As some of these problems can affect your lifestyle or the structure of the house, instead of stressing over these repairs and going into debt, you can simply dip into your emergency fund. However, your emergency fund is for emergencies only and not to be used for non-essential expenses like redecorating your house helps you with your budget. Your emergency fund can help you with your budget. While you are planning your budget, there may be a few things that you forget to include. Having an emergency fund will help cover any unexpected expenses, like gifts or fees while you are still in the first year of budgeting. 
An emergency fund will protect you from any surprises you haven't accounted for that can arise when you are on a budget. Protect you from debt. Being debt-free should be on your list of priorities of financial goals. Instead of borrowing money in the event of unexpected expenses, you can just tap into your emergency fund. You don't have to get into debt each time your car breaks down or a family member gets sick. Your emergency fund can cover all these expenses so you can remain debt-free. Budgeting is an essential part of your financial plan, and it will help you achieve your financial goals and save money for the future. Sticking to your budget is vital, as it is the only way to track your expenses and improve your spending habits. Consider budgeting and saving today, and you will notice your financial situation improving.